right, good morning, everyone. Oh, it's good to have everyone. Welcome to all those online. How you doing? Can I have a Pop-Tart, please? It's all right. Thought I'd put an order in. Be kind of cool if it showed up, right? You guys would be impressed. You guys are easy to impress. All right. So good morning. We are in a series on miracles, and so we're going to jump back in. Last week, we took a little pause, talked about praying for a miracle. If you missed that, you missed a miracle, so you can go back and listen online. Today, we're going to talk about a, a, a neat one, one that you've probably have heard if you've been in church for any length of time, and that is where Lazarus is called out of the grave and into life, and kind of the overarching story of it, and then we're going to break it down and look at it a little bit different today, um, is that whenever Jesus walks into a room, no matter how dead something is, when he walks into your environment, you have the potential of coming to life in that area. And I think it's so important that we recognize Lazarus is dead for not one day, not two days, not three days, not, no, it was four days, right? He's dead for four days. So when you're dead for four days, just so you know, you're dead, all right? And so uh, Jesus walks into his life calls him out and he experiences life. And so if you have your Bibles, it's going to be in John chapter 11. The scripture's in your outline. It'll be on the screen. If you're watching online, you can also download uh, the outline and follow along today. So y'all ready to start your engines? All right. So today we're going to watch Jesus walk to into a funeral. All right, and uh, it reminded me when I when I started kind of jotting this down and, and doing it. It reminded me of a kind of a cute story. There was a graveside service uh, that the church was having for a gentleman in their church, and so a bunch of the folks went to support the wife and and the family members and. One lady brought her little son, just a little guy, and brought him along to the graveside, and they're standing around. The, the pastor gives a, the committal service for the graveside service, and he reads in Genesis 3 where it says, from dust you've come and from dust you shall depart, right? And then they lowered the casket, all right? And so everyone, you know, hugged each other. They went home. So the little guy decides to go and create a fort in his, in his room under his bed. Any of you guys ever do that? Pull the sheets over, instant fort, you know what I'm talking about? Got a flashlight and all that stuff. So he's playing underneath the bed, and, and he's looking around, and he's doing whatever he's doing. And all of a sudden, the flashlight caught the corner of the wall where they come together, and he noticed a pile of dust. And he screamed, Mom, come in here. She comes running in. She didn't know if the bed fell on him. She didn't know if he hurt himself. She comes running in. She's like, honey, what's wrong? And he says, there's a pile of dust in the corner, and I can't tell if the guy's coming or going. <laughs> you like that? So we're going to take up the offering and go home. That's all I have today, all right? You might as well end, end on a good note, right? All right. So John chapter 11, uh, we're looking at this funeral experience that Jesus is going to walk into, and I want to kind of set a little bit of the backstory uh, of what's taking place. Lazarus is going to be dead for four days. The sisters are going to call him to Jesus when before he dies, and by the time he gets there, he's dead. So in verse 1, it says, now a man named, uh, named Lazarus was sick. Uh, he was from Bethany, the village of Mary and his sister Martha. And so there's a bunch of Marys in the Bible, so we're going to get some clarity of what that is in verse 2. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured, poured perfume on the Lord and wiped uh, his feet with her hair. You remember that story? Well, that's the Mary that we're talking about, all right? Verse 3. So, uh, so uh, the sisters sent word to Jesus Lord, the one you love is sick. So we don't know the depth of the relationship, but we know that it's just more than a casual relationship. That Jesus with Mary and Martha and with Lazarus, there was some kind of a greater relationship than just kind of passing friends. And so uh, they sent word, it's like the one you know, that you love, he is, past, uh, uh, he is sick, verse four. <clears throat> and so then uh, when Jesus heard this, he said, not to them, but to the disciples, this sickness will not, let's read the last four words in bold right there, will not, will not end in death, okay? Now, what's interesting here is what we're going to see is a little bit of the backstory, and it's going to help us to kind of understand in our own life, all right, that, that oftentimes we see the perspective in life from Mary and Martha, 
brother that we love is sick, it's not looking good. All right? Jesus, in this case, is actually sharing a little behind the story, a little divine intervention that's going to take place with his disciples that Mary and Martha do not know about yet. Right? And so he says to the disciples, hey guys, this illness is not going to end in death. And he goes on, no, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Right? And so often in our life, we're living in Mary and Martha's world, right? The world is coming apart, things are happening, whatever the case is. But Jesus is active over here. We don't always see it and we don't always feel it in our life. And so the kind of a, a little unique uh, scenario that's, that's taking place in it, there's a little behind the scenes stuff. That's, that's taking place, a little divine strategy, right? And so I think it's, it's important for us to, to point that out as we begin to move forward, all right? So with that being said, I want to share with you a confession, all right? Are you ready? And I know you're going to be thoroughly disappointed in me, but I do not have any superpowers, okay? Just so you know, you're following a guy that doesn't have any superpowers. So like, for instance, I do not have the ability to drive down the road and hit every green light. You, you know what I'm saying? And when, and when I go to Costco to get gas, like I did last week, not that I'm bitter or anything, <clears throat> when I show up, for whatever reason, everyone else is showing up at the same time, right? And so I stick my head out the window. It's like, excuse me, do you know who I am? Pastor Dan, Laurel Ridge, right? And then I get cut off. Now, I'm not bitter. I'm just sharing my heart, right? They're pulling in the wrong way. It's like there, there's an arrow. It's going that way for a reason, not this way, right? So I peel off. I finally I took the, the name off my back of my car, the Laurel Ridge name. I still have my name on it. So, you know, I could bless other people, tell them how great they are. You know what I'm saying? Tell them where they could go or not go. You know, those things. So, so I don't have any, and you don't have any of that either. I don't have the ability to write a message and see little cuts of your life. I, I wish that, I, wouldn't that be cool? It's like I'm sitting down to write a message like, oh, yeah, that's a good, oh, look at, oh, no. That, they need to confess that, okay, right? Would that be cool? I don't have that ability. But I do have this ability, and so do you. I can see dead people. It's true, and so can you. When I go to Costco, and I grab my cart, and I start going shopping for myself and for the church and, and anybody else who wants to, me to shop for them, <laughs> I see dead people walking around. I get in my car, and I leave, and I get on Highway 4, and I head back to the church. There's dead people driving 95 miles an hour right alongside me. You guys are pretty good. That's good. That's, I can't get anything past you. All right? Now, some of you are like, what did he say? <laughs> Just laugh. It's hilarious, all right? <clears throat> Go to the other kind of grocery store, right? Place called Home Depot. Dead people in there, too. Lots of them, actually. Even when I come to church sometimes, I see dead people. So do you. You see dead people as well. Because what we're going to learn today is that you can be living on the outside, but you can be dead on the inside. There, there, there can be death on the inside, or you may be dying in some, some cases. <clears throat> if you look with me in your outline, you can be dead while you live, right? You can be dead while you live. In 1 Timothy, it says this, but the widow who lives for pleasure is dead even while she lives, right? So, so, so you can live your life and you can be alive on the outside and I can pinch you and you would say, ow, and I could stick a needle in your foot and you'd say, ow, and, and you, could, you could have all the sensations of life and yet inside you could be dying or in some cases dead, well, one of the things that we've learned through uh, the COVID is that a lot of relationships have died, and we'll see more and more of that as time goes on in the mental health area, that people that 
um, seem to distance themselves and kind of hi hi uh, hibernate and all that kind of stuff. Now they're beginning to recognize that the relationships that they had in the past are kind of drying up and are, have died. Social media brings lots of death to relationships because why would you interact with a person in real life when you could just kind of type it out on the thing, right? And then you read about how great their life is and your life sucks. You know that site? Yeah? Marriages. See, lots of couples at Costco shopping together. And your first thought is, oh, how nice. Then I see dead relationships, right? They have the idea that in the Old Testament, it says a, father, or a man will leave his father and mother and will cleave unto his wife, and the two will become one. That they get confused. They think that the two will live under one roof, and they're just roommates. Their relationship isn't really alive. It's dead. It's dying. And, and yet on the outside, they're living. You pull up to a stop sign, because I have to stop at a stop sign because I don't have superpowers, and I look over and I go, man, that is a cool looking car. Ooh, slick. Right? But the person's dead inside because they think that their strategy in life is make all you can, can all you get, and then sit on your can. There's no purpose in life. They just think that you make more, make more, make more, and that's it. And yet they sit in that slick car, and inside they're empty. There's no life in them. So if I was to summarize verses 5 through 16, <clears throat> we're going to get into three of the folks that we look at in this miracle. So Jesus says to his disciples, hey, Lazarus is asleep. He actually is going to be dying. And he says, we, we want to go there. And the disciples are like, Lord, we've been there before. And the last time we were there, the Jews tried to kill us. So how about this? We'll just pray for the brother. He'll die. So what? We're going to live. All right? And so Jesus is like, no, this illness is not going to end in death. That it's being done so that the son will be glorified. So I want to talk to you about three of the players in this miracle and really how we fit into their life and the struggles that they have. So three different death traps that we'll look at, at in, in this miracle. Number one in your outline is the first guy is Thomas, right? And Thomas is known for... Thomas, so only this side spiritual. Thomas is known for... All right, so finally this side over here got saved. Good, all right. So I'm going to read a little bit into the text, a little sarcasm on Thomas's part, right? And so, so Thomas is with Jesus, and they're like, hey, we're going to go back to Judah. And he's like, I don't really want to go there. It's not a good idea. So in verse 16, then Thomas, called Didymus, is actually in the, in the Greek, it's P. Diddy Didymus. You know that guy? He's still around. <laughs> Said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. In other words, they tried to kill us once before. That's a great idea. Let's just go, right? And so here we find that Thomas is dead in his doubts. Do you ever feel that way? Do you ever get in, your, in a situation in your life where, where you feel like overwhelmed and doubts just kind of come, not, not like kind of crashing, it's like, a, it's like a hurricane, typhoon, it's like all the storms all combined in your mind. And you sit there and you think, you know, the Lord is with us and God is good and he's working and we sang that song and isn't Eric great with his prayers and all that stuff? And then all of a sudden, <laughs> doubt. I mean, maybe in Eric's life, but not my life, right? I mean, I'm not as close as he is, right? And then doubt begins to overwhelm you in life. And then you're reminded, hey, the Lord will never leave you nor forsake you. And look to your neighbor and go, amen, what a great promise. Look to your neighbor and say, amen, what a great promise. Simon says, look to your neighbor and say, what a great promise, right? But then, but then you go to a place 
or an environment or a situation, and you don't feel them at all. And you kind of wonder, is this thing even true? I mean, is it even actually true? It reminds me of a little story where this mom's cooking, and I, I said, uh, she had a pantry in the basement in the first ser- service. I said, we, you know, a lot of folks around here don't have basements, and I was corrected in the first service. You know what I'm saying? So all of us who have basements, exactly, all right. So mom said, hey, honey, go into the basement and get a can of tomato sauce so I can finish making, my, making dinner. And he's like, mom, I don't want to go down there. And he's like, five. And she says, what do you mean you don't want to go down there? He says, I'm scared to go down there. And she said, well, honey, you you need to understand this. Jesus is down there with you. And he said, Jesus is down there? And she said, yeah, honey, Jesus is down there. He opens up the door and goes, yo, Jesus, give me some of that soup. (laughs) Right? So we know it in our hearts theologically, but in our spirit, there's times where we don't feel it, right? We, 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 We struggle with that in our life. Second one is, see if you can relate to this, Martha, she was dead in delay, right? She was dead in delay. When you need a miracle, when do you need it? Yesterday, not now. You needed it yesterday, right? Isn't that true, right? So, so, so she is dead in her delay. Look with me in verse 17. On his arri- arrival, Jesus uh, uh, found Lazarus had already been in the tomb for how many days? Four. So that's really dead for those of you who don't know, all right? Verse 21, Lord Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died, right? In other words, when we need God to intervene in our life, and someone says, God's timing is perfect, you're like, well, my timing's even more perfect than that. I need it now. I don't need it tomorrow. I don't need it next week. I need it now. In fact, I needed it yesterday, right? And there, there, people say, well, God, there's three answers that God gives us. Yes, no, and wait, right? Yes is great, right? Isn't that good? No sometimes is good too. But wait is deadly, isn't it? It's like you're going to be patient and just wait on the timing of the Lord. You're like, Lord, can I move you along a little bit? Maybe you're distracted. I want, I want to kind of move you along. And so in our life, there are times in our life where physically we need a healing, mentally we need a healing, a relationship needs a healing. Sometimes the more we pray for a person, the worse it gets, right? You ever pray for your re- a relationship, like for God to restore it, you're praying and it gets worse? And, and, and God has you in a delay mode. So the first one's doubt, the second one's delay, and then the third one is Mary, and she is dead in her discouragement. She is dead in her discouragement. And, and look, 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 what her, look what she does in verse 20. Now Martha heard that Jesus was coming, and she went out to meet him. But Mary, what did she do? Are you with me today, guys, or what? All right, I, I can just leave and go and finish my cup of coffee. You want me to leave? So what did, what did Mary do? Yeah, she shut the blinds and she said, you know what? I'm depressed. I'm just going to pull the covers over my head. Because he's been dead for four days. What's the hope? What's the use? Why are we even having a conversation? Why are we running out to him to do something? This guy's been dead for four days. And so when you're dead for four days, you're dead. So oftentimes in our life, we feel that way. Discouragement kind of rushes into our life. I mean, maybe you've tried to, get a, to go to a, an addiction clinic or go to some type of 12-step program to overcome an obstacle that you have or habit in your life. And it's like, I tried and I couldn't and I tried and I couldn't. And it's like, forget it. I'm just throwing up my hands. Maybe you went to counseling for a relationship to restore a marriage or to restore a relationship with somebody. I mean, maybe you're trying to get out of financial debt. And, and, and you're driving around the cool car, right? You're dead inside and you recognize, you know what, there's more to life and you want to begin to peel that away. And yet at the same time, it's like the harder you try to get out of debt, the deeper you get. And you're filled with discouragement. Fear and anxiety, right? It's one of the things that we're learning through, this, uh, through COVID is that fear and anxiety is definitely off the chart, right? 
And, and so we, we experience in our life, so we have doubt, we have delay, and we have discouragement. So let me just kind of pause for a moment, and let me ask you, when you look at your life, is there an area of your life that's dying or perhaps it's dead? And then the question is that we're going to answer is, is it possible for Jesus to walk into your environment and you to experience life like he desires for you to have? And if it's true, what do we have to do in order for that to take place? So I'm glad that you're here because now we're going to get into some good stuff. All right, you ready? So in verse 33, it goes on, it says, when Jesus saw Martha weeping and the Jews who had come along with him, uh, uh, with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and in trouble, okay? And, and I think it's important to just kind of point this out just as a reminder to all of us. Now, now remember, Mary and Martha, their brother's dead, okay? Jesus has already told the disciples in a different scene that this sickness is not going to end in death. All right. So when he gets there to the funeral, they're crying, and he doesn't walk in and go, come on, lighten up. Wipe the tears off your head. This is going to be amazing. Check this out. He's moved, and he's deeply troubled. In fact, in verse 35, right, shortest verse in all the Bible, he says, Jesus wept, right? And it's a reminder to us that even though he knows what he's going to do, Right? The sisters don't, and he has compassion on them because there are seasons in our life where we're in doubt, where we're in delay, when we're, we're experiencing all those, and he's still comforting us. He's at the right hand of the Father, right? In fact, the scripture says that, that he's praying for us. I mean, how cool is that? Right? And so I think it's just a great reminder to recognize that when we're in those seasons of life, that he still cares. Even though he knows what he's going to do, he still cares. So in your outline, the question, Jesus came uh, into this world to do what? To save us, but also to give us life, all right? And this is kind of an important part. So in your outline, Jesus came so that you could live. Now, it isn't so that you can just live in heaven one day, that someday your heart's going to stop, you're going to stop breathing, you're going to die, praise Jesus, you're going to go to heaven. He desires for us to live life on this earth as well until that time comes for him to take us away, right? Not to just exist, but to actually live life. And so in, in, in John chapter 10, verse 10, it says this, the thief comes only to, and I like only, right, only to steal and to kill and destroy. So what does the enemy want to do? He only wants to steal, kill, and destroy your life. Aside from that, he's a pretty good guy. You ought to hang out with him or not. Jesus says that I have come that you may have what? And if you want to know what that life looks like, you might have it to the What? In other words, that that you're not just existing, that you're thriving in this world. That that you have, because of the power of the resurrection dwells in our heart, that we have the ability to experience resurrection power, Easter's just a couple weeks away, right? To live a life that's filled with joy, right? That's filled with peace, that's filled with purpose, even in the midst of adversity that we experience, and, and, and I don't know how you felt, I, I mentioned in the first service, you know, with all the news, both domestically and worldly, it is so heavy, right? And I came in today and I was going through my message, I, I'm, I sit down here and I'm like, Lord, I need a fresh touch, right? I, I just need you to intervene from heaven, and I don't know about you, but me, this is all about me today, all right? And just touch my life, right? Because it's like, ah, oh, it's so much, right? Yeah. So here's the big idea in your outline. Stop dressing like a dead man. Okay, stop dressing like a dead man. Jesus came to give us life, not someday in heaven, but here today on this earth. He can walk into the life of a guy that's been dead for four days and bring life to it. He can walk into your environment, whatever is dying or dead, and he can bring life to it, right? Yes, you can clap for that. 
So I say, and you can jot this down, stop speaking like a dead man, stop thinking like a dead man, stop acting like a dead man, and might I say this with boldness, stop hanging out with dead people. So now I don't have any friends. (laughs) Verse 43, verse 43. At least no one to go to Costco with me. My wife won't even go to Costco with me. She's like, I'm not going to Costco with you. Like, why? I peeled the sticker off the back of the car. Verse 43. I behave. Trust me, I behave, all right? (laughs) Jesus called. (laughs) All right, I don't. (laughs) There it is. Lord, forgive me. So I run the people over in the hallway, in the aisleways. Please, if you're in front of me, please step aside. I got a siren on my cart, and I'm like, woo, 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 right? So step out of the way. I'm going to get one of those. <laughs> Jesus called in a loud voice. <laughs> Pastor Dan, get out of here. No, he called out in a loud voice. Lazarus, say it together. Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, and his hands and feet wrapped in strips of loin, And the cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Right? And I I say to you, stop thinking, stop acting, stop talking, stop hanging out with dead people. So I was doing a study for in the fall. I, I do study for my messages sometimes that far in advance. And I came across an interesting statistic. I was studying about minds and how, you, how we think. And I, I came across this study, and it says the average person has 30,000 thoughts in a day. Now, I know some of you are thinking, you don't know who I'm married to. And you could take that any way you want. <laughs> the women are thinking, he hasn't had three thoughts in nine years. And the guys are thinking, 30,000? That's nothing, right? All right, we got that out of the way. And here's what the study shows. That the average person has about 70% of their thoughts negative. Just pause for a moment, right? So 30,000 thoughts on average... 70% of those are negative. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Thoughts, feelings, actions. Stop thinking like a dead person. Stop talking like a dead person. Stop hanging around with dead people who reinforce your dead speaking and your dead thinking. Change the environment. Jesus walks in to Lazarus' life. He's been dead for four days, and he comes in and he says, Lazarus, come out. And I, and I say to you in love, hey, folks, you're not dead. You're alive, right? You're alive. Verse 25, so Jesus says to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Right? And the question isn't, do you believe that I'm going to resurrect your brother? The question is a personal question. Do you believe that Jesus is the resurrection? And I pause and I ask you that. Do you believe that? Okay, now, now here's what happens. We play church, don't we? And, and, and where it's like, oh, you know all the answers. Like my, my wife that teaches in the preschool, you know, she asks a question. It's like, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, God, the Bible, right? It's like, no, who cleans your room? You know, that kind of thing. They just instantly spiel out the, the church answer. Well, the church answer is, yeah, he's the, he's the resurrection. But do you believe that? Right? Because that's the question that he asks her. Do you embrace it? Do you trust it? Do you live it in your life? That he is the power of the resurrection. So I want to teach you a principle about how this works in our everyday life. Okay? How do we, when we have 70% of our thoughts negative, 
And we're thinking and we're talking and we're acting like dead people. And yet we know in our hearts that we need to live like a living person. And we walk out there in the world and we get hit with doubt. We get hit with delay. We get hit with dis- discouragement. How do we break that? How do we actually live in a life where we feel, uh, feel alive? So let me give you a, a little bit of help in that. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to turn back a couple chapters to John chapter 8 in verse 31. All right, so here, here's what Jesus says. Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are my disciples, okay? The word hold means, in your outline, it means to stay in a given place, state, relation, or ec- expectancy, all right? Now, grab a hold of this. I'm telling you, for those of you who feel like, man, I need this message today, I gotta change the way that I'm thinking, this will change your world, all right? So when you walk into the environment, doubt, discouragement, delay is overwhelming you, okay? That is the world in which we live in. It's broke, all right? And so I walk into that environment in my head, and I recognize that the promise is that God will never leave me nor forsake me. All right, so I'm in a place where I'm feeling a little bit overwhelmed. I'm feeling anxious about whatever's going on in my life. And so I walk into it and I say, you know, God will never leave me nor forsake me. The human side of me is instantly gonna fall back into doubt, discouragement, and well, maybe he loves me, but he's not acting fast enough, delay, right? And so I have a choice and I'm gonna do one of two things. It's, It's in your outline, right? You're gonna either, you're gonna either escape or retreat back into darkness thinking like a dead person and you're gonna just go back and you're gonna allow the doubts and the discouragement and delay and all that stuff overwhelm me, overwhelm you and you're gonna be living like a dead person. Or you can stay in that truth. Okay? Now, here's the great thing about it. You can still be filled with discouragement. You can still be filled with doubt. You can still feel like God isn't moving quick enough. But if you will continue to stay there and continue to allow your mind to focus in on that and hold on to it, right? As Paul says, hold every, every thought captive until it becomes obedient to Christ, right? If you can stay in that mind space and you can even say, God, I am so discouraged. I feel like throwing up my hands, but I'm going to stay here, right? I, I'm not even sure where you're at, where you're at, and you could open up the door and look and see if he's in the parking lot, right? But I'm going to, Lord, I'm just going to hold on to it and I'm going to live there and I'm not going to Retreat back to the dead man thinking, living, and speaking in your life. Okay? Now, now look what happens. Yeah, you can clap for that. So look what, look what happens. Then you will know the truth. Right? And, and the word know is aha. You ever have one of those moments? Right? Where all of a sudden you're like, oh, that's what that means right? You don't have that moment if you retreat back to it because it's overwhelming and I feel so discouraged and I feel like giving up and I'm just going to sneak back into my room, pull the covers over my head, and I'm not even going to go out and meet Jesus, right? I'm going to stay there in that truth and I'm going to live in that truth and I'm just going to keep my mind there and I'm going to allow it to wash over me. And then the promise is you will know the truth, In other words, you will experience the peace. You will experience the joy. You will experience the confidence that only the Holy Spirit can give a life of a believer. And in that moment, you'll go, this is what it feels like to have peace that truly passes all understanding. Because in the past, my mind would be spinning like a top. But instead, I have full confidence God, that you're with me, and you stay there. So I say to you, in love, everything in every single one of us, because we're all human and we're all flawed, is to run to darkness, because that's what life, that's how the sinful nature is. And you can either retreat to darkness, and you can continue to talk and think 
and act and hang out with dead people. Or you can allow Christ to walk into your environment, and even when you don't understand it, even when it doesn't make sense, even when you're overwhelmed, even when all those things, you pause in that moment. And you say, Lord, I'm just going to sit right here. This fanny is not going to move until I understand and I get what it is that you want me to get. And then you will know the truth. And your life will be set free. And you will experience him in a whole new way. In a way that people will think you're crazy and you need therapy. But you don't need therapy. You just need more of Jesus. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity to gather. And Lord, I pray whether it's folks here who are in person or online, Lord, we all need a fresh touch from you. Lord, we, all, we need that moment where you'll come into our life and you'll just breathe life into an area of our life that is dead. And Lord, we know that you are that God who can do that. Not only did you raise Lazarus from the dead, but we also remember the, the resurrection and that each of us as believers have the power of the resurrection, the Holy Spirit dwelling in our hearts. And Father, whatever the situation and scenario is that the folks are here in, I pray, Lord, that they will have the boldness and the confidence to allow you to walk into their life and remain there and pause there and allow your truth to wash over them. And we give you all the praise for that. And maybe you're here today and you've never given your life to Christ, and I want to give you that opportunity. We do a little ABC. There's no formula. It's just the way that we do it. But A is admit that we're sinners. We are all sinners. B is believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that he died on a cross and that he rose again. And C is to confess him to be your Lord and Savior. And so if you're here today or you're watching online and you've never invited Christ into your life, just pray this prayer silently as I say. Just repeat after me. Just say, Lord Jesus, today... I admit that I am a sinner, and I believe, Jesus, that you are the Christ, the Son of God, that you died on a cross and that you rose again. And today, I confess you to be my Lord and Savior. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for making me a brand new creation in Christ. It's in Jesus' name I pray, and all God's people said... Amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer and you're online, you can text the number on the screen. If you're here in person and you prayed that prayer, there's some green bags on the back wall. If you feel free to grab one of those. There's some information to help you to grow in your faith, all right? So Simon says, stand. I'm not Simon, but I thought I'd play him today, all right? All right. So how many of you need to take off your duck clothes? Not literally. We don't need that today. All right? Got some dead clothes to take away? All right? May you walk in the freedom of Christ. May you be set free from the bondage, right? And may you glorify him in every step that you take. God bless you guys. We'll see you on the way out. Wow, what an incredible experience. Remember, we go live every weekend. So be sure to hit subscribe on our channel so you can be notified whenever we upload a new content. I also want to invite you to join us in person when you get a chance. Joining us for one of our in-person services is a great way to meet and interact with new people in our Laurel Ridge family. You can find out more about Laurel Ridge and activities for your whole family by visiting our website. We can't wait to see you next time. Until then, have a great week and remember, God loves you.